Attention. Central. This is Sheriff Daniel Stahamutza. I'm reaching out to the 111th Police Precinct in New York City, Queens County. I'm currently on the, um, Cross Island Parkway heading west, alongside Clearview Park Golf Course. Notifying all available patrols to investigate the area. Um, due to a swarm of insects causing significant traffic congestion. I repeat, it's a swarm causing traffic difficulties and hovering above us. Additionally, I request heightened attention at the call center as there have been reports of what they're calling giant... What? Giant moths. I'm not sure if it's some kind of code word for a terrorist act, a gang activity, or whatever, but I'm urging extreme caution. Protocol 42 should be implemented under official orders to maintain the situation. I repeat, giant moths have been reported. I repeat, these are civilians' words. Keep us informed of the situation. During the following week, a vast number of moth swarms were sighted in Queens County, displaying high aggression upon contact with human skin. In response to the authorities' decisions to hire pest control and extermination teams, three workers were severely injured. Subsequent hospital reports documented burns that turned the skin gelatinous and in the most extreme case transformed one of the workers' limbs into an inexplicable appendage with tentacle-like features, covered in hair as tough as a nail. On April 11, the New York City police unexpectedly closed the vicinity of Alley Pond Park, due to a notice from the State Health Service. City biological risk agents swiftly entered the area following the sudden appearance of peculiar bodies. According to reports from the previous night, these bodies had been perched on the trees and began falling during the early morning hours. In eyewitness accounts from park neighbors, they observed these strange creatures writhing on the ground as if experiencing some form of epileptic seizure. I was walking my little pup with my boyfriend last night. Everything was chill. You know, traffic always crazy around here. But suddenly, my dog got all alert, barking like crazy at the top of a tree. Tried to see what it was, and then that thing fell loudly to the ground, and the dogs got so spooked. Never seen an animal run away so desperately before.
emergency biological response team took the fallen creatures in the park. They were brought to the underground labs of the Federal Military Hospital for study. The strange bodies seemed to be some kind of moth malformation, with extensive tentacles that, despite being confirmed as lifeless, continued to move with the intention of protecting the main body mass. Apparently, these creatures had been biologically programmed to safeguard their most vital organs. However, the nature of these didn't appear to be a mere mutation. It possibly resulted from a failed experiment in crossbreeding genetically incompatible species. This theory gained momentum until it was realized that all of them shared the same human vital systems within. In fact, these bodies were an insectoid amalgamation of human beings, possibly operating on a hive mind were all simultaneously obeyed. This would explain why the majority fell from the trees at the same time, and why their actions were precisely synchronized. With each in-depth study of these creatures, the revelations became increasingly spine-chilling. It was covered that those tentacles were, in reality, hyperdeveloped dendrites of human neurons. Something had caused the human nervous system to merge with an insectoid body, creating a kind of intelligent creature, but with severe survival challenges. Both oxygen and certain pollutants produced by industries and transportation severely weakened them. The most astonishing case was the study of a part of a human head, which, in just two days, began to transform into an elongated mass that occupied the entire size of an operating room. This is a panoramic shot from way back there. Yeah, that's where those damn lunatics are. Channel 2 News with Dave Young, Jim Conrad, and Glenn Gerberg's Weather.
Channel 2 News, Denver's first late newscast. Good evening, it's 9 o'clock in Denver, and thank you for joining us. They're trying to unravel a UFO mystery in Cheyenne tonight. Something, something hovered over the city early Wednesday morning. The National UFO Center says that something was probably nothing more than twinkling stars, but some people in Wyoming are not convinced. We have two reports tonight, beginning with Channel 2's Julie Hayden. Hey, you're not busy. I'd like you to look at something. I got something spotted up here in the sky. I can't figure out what it is. This is a picture of the unidentified flying object that hovered over Cheyenne early Wednesday morning. Engine 1, ambulance assist, fast vehicle 4. Cheyenne's 911 dispatch got the call about 2.30 from a police officer looking for help, figuring out just what it was he was looking at. Check your uh, book there, see if you have a number for, uh, a direct number for Denver, Denver Center. Reservations for lodging are required and should be made as early as possible. You'll never forget the view from the main lounge at the Jackson Lake Lodge. The lounge's 60-foot window frames the spectacular scene across the water. Horseback riding, swimming, and raft trips are available from the Jackson Lake Lodge area. For a special and secluded vacation at the foot of the Tetons, the Jenny Lake Lodge has it all. The Jackson Lake Lodge, located in Grand Teton National Park in the state of Wyoming, founded in 1955, is a series of hotels situated along Jackson Lake, blending the rustic style of the locality with modern amenities for a comfortable vacation. It has emerged as one of the most intriguing recreational centers in the American heartland. Following the enormous success of the initial hotel complex built on the same site in 1922, the Snake River Land Company acquired the facilities to shape the current establishment. In 1989, an event as strange as it was unprecedented took place. It was mid-August, and the center was suddenly invaded by a swarm of moths of various sizes. The event necessitated the immediate evacuation of each hotel room. Some of the residents present on the premises suffered attacks from these insects,
causing mass allergic skin reactions. everyone take a seat, blood brethren. Today is an incredibly significant day for the future of our church. We have placed our trust in the grace of our Savior, who stands as the hand of the one God. This dawn, while conducting my prayers, I received a direct revelation from my own home. He has entrusted me to initiate the process of inoculation in each one of us. As you already know, and as we have been practicing for years, we will select the purest among us and take them to the underground chamber. There, they will be grafted by our celestial protector, and they will enjoy his divine form. Children of my Orohoi, we have waited for so many years. These revelations have been delivered for millennia to those who preceded us. And it will be the legacy of generations to come. I call on upon Father Casparoni to bring the cages, bring forth the new children of my Orohoi. Fear not the power of our divine hand. He will bless us all with our new form. Glory to my Orohoi. Glory to my Orohoi. Send them to the catacombs for the divine judgment. Once again, it happened in Buffalo. The police and firefighters from Johnson County intervened just in time before a house exploded due to a gas leak. It is presumed that once more it may have been one of the ancient Meorohoj cults, which has had similar incidents in the state. Williston, a city located in Chittenden County, Vermont, it is the second largest city in the county with a population of approximately 40,000 residents. The history recounts that the region's first inhabitants were the Abenaki indigenous peoples, who extended their presence beyond American territory, reaching the heart of the Canadian province of Quebec. 
With the arrival of the first European settlers in the 17th century, mainly English and to a lesser extent French, the first permanent settlements of modern Vermont were established. During the American Revolutionary War, Williston was a significant battleground. The famous Battle of Hubberton took place there in 1777, which was of great importance in delaying the British advance towards Albany, New York, a decisive factor for the future. After the war and with the establishment of the modern nation in the 20th century, Williston began to thrive in the shadow of Burlington, dedicating its primary economic activities to agriculture, forestry, and manufacturing. In 1951, Michael Rudin, a Catholic priest, started a crucial mission in Williston for social protection and the proper growth of children. Despite the initial aversion to Catholic doctrine on American soil, Father Rowden's works deeply influenced the city's inhabitants. By his explicit orders, Andrian Casperoni and Carlo Fauver arrived from France in 1952, becoming key figures in the strange transformation of the original Church of the Last Jesus Christ Project. Casperoni and Fauver introduced unusual changes to Catholic doctrine, warmly received as unprecedented in 1950s American society. They established the dogma of the second intermediary between God and men, an entity whose strength could be understood as superior to the Holy Spirit, while simultaneously being an expression of it. Although this idea is not entirely clear, the parishioners actively participated in reconstructing other doctrinal precepts of Catholicism. Some devoted so much time to this cause that they moved to live in these churches and actively engaged in converting both tourists and residents of Burlington. In 1953, all of Williston was in some way involved with Father Rowden's church. The fervor for this new entity, which provided them with unparalleled spiritual joy called Niaroho, led them to build enormous stone monoliths erected at certain points in the city. According to their testimonies, these were the true symbols of the Holy Trinity, places that would also serve as beacons for the children of this omnipotent entity. Meorohoi was constantly represented with the image of a giant moth. Williston residents claimed that this was indeed its true form, and that, due to the complexities of the earthly plane in contrast to the celestial world, its manifestation could not occur naturally until men, mortals, were capable of assimilating its form and bringing it back to where it rightfully belonged, where its glory could reign. In many of the cults held at least twice a week, large quantities of small moths were used, released inside the church or around the monoliths. In addition, underground, there were types of farms for the children of Mayoroha, where they raised those moths that had, according to their speeches, been direct messengers from the other plane. These were captured in larger cages, fed with garbage remains, and kept with a priest who interrogated them daily, demanding revelations and paths of perfection. Some of them did not survive in captivity, so their bodies were exhibited in the churches as symbols replacing the cross of Christ. These moths were considered sacred bodies of Mayoral Ho's earthly sacrifice. However, not everything was unity and worship in Williston. Although information about this is scarce, only a photograph and a brief description have been found. Joseph has been punished under the laws of the Morwa Church. He bears the martyrdom of divinity unappended, and his hands have been carefully sewn according to the doctrine of 1952. He will proceed to be delivered to the children of Morwai in the holy fields under the Church of Slate Barn Drive. 
This excerpt possibly was a public announcement of one of the punishments for heretics or even possible spies. It is well known, thanks to existing documentation, that until the federal intervention of 1957, the city of Williston had regressed in its agricultural commerce expansion policies, even in closing the perimeter and placing paramilitary custody on the vehicular entryways. Therefore, it is suspected that during the last years, no one could enter or leave the city. Subsequent photographs have shown the extensive underground network, where more prisoners may have been found, whose remains were never found beyond marks on the walls indicating that they desperately tried to cling to an iron post to which they were chained. During the final stage of Father Rowden's church intervention in Williston, dated from 1955 to 1957, rituals involving huge pyres around the monoliths intensified at a frenetic pace. Apparently, the city's inhabitants, and mainly the members of this religious group, had received revelations regarding fire and the purification of the soul. These activities ultimately alerted the authorities. It is not clear what actually happened in these rituals, but it can be assured that many people disappeared after these events, and many activities got out of control, leading to the burning of the churches they had built. Some even showed signs of having exploded due to intentional gas leaks. The Vermont History Museum incredibly managed to preserve photographs that the residents themselves took during one of the last ritualistic activities in Williston. These had originally been in the possession of Father Carlo Fover before his arrest in 1958, where he was found hidden in the attic of a small house in the city of Cheyenne, Wyoming. In one of these photographs, and as confirmed by one of the curators and founding members of the museum, a caption is displayed in the same handwriting as Father Fovars, indicating, My aura wash has awakened after billions of years of dimensional sleep. Its will shall be one with that of God, and it will disseminate its grace for eternity. The careful study of this case by historians, theologians, and photography experts alike, has been able to determine with almost 100% certainty that something of indescribable nature was indeed thrown from the flames into the world, in a process that has not yet been explained by natural sciences. The Mayorohoi case began to appear in different cities across the United States since the late 1950s. Overshadowed by the Cold War, but with unfortunate consequences related to strange fires associated with people bearing moth-shaped tattoos on their arms and legs.
I can't believe it. Finally, you've transformed into one of us. You've been granted the grace of our Savior. Relax. You don't need to. Don't breathe so heavily. John, are you still there? It's me, Father Rudin. I've come to see you. And I must congratulate you on your sacrifice. You did this for all of us and your brothers who joined you. I know. Skin may feel strange. Some were warm and painful. But you must remain calm. This form has been what my Orochoish has wanted for you. Once you get used to it, it would be a marvel for you. I understand that breathing might be difficult at the moment, but in the days to come, you'll realize you no longer need it. Your wings will spread, and from there, you'll obtain what you need to stay alive. Please, stay calm. We'll be back next week, hoping to see you back again. On October 13, 1995, the FBI executed an official search warrant at a farm in Chittenden County, Vermont. At the site, only the three caretakers and signatories of the land protection contract were present, a contract dating back to the mid-1950s. These three men had agreed to maintain a single building amidst the cornfields, which belonged to Michael Rodin, the founder of the Church of Myorohoy in the city of Williston. The men had limited knowledge of what had happened in that era, and in fact, they were greatly disturbed by the intervention of federal agents. After the interrogation process, it was determined that the men had no connection to the events in Williston in the past, and in fact, their contract had been signed by a third party, of whom they were unaware. The father of one of these men had left the site as an inheritance. Photographs of the exterior of the central building revealed a series of sculptures, possibly stolen from nearby churches, as well as the only remnant of one of the enormous monoliths erected in the cult of Myorohoi. The central building had two entrance doors, which were securely closed, with an electrical system protecting them from the inside. The arrested men claimed that eight years ago, individuals in luxurious cars arrived, claiming to be members of the county council, and they carried out repairs both inside and outside the building, remodeling the lighting and gates. Inside, the men asserted that they only stored tools and maintained irrigation systems in the vast territory of the farm. It was also the location where generators controlled access to electricity and potable water for their residences.
Arthur DeFrancello was one of the men in charge who was present during the three-week operation to dismantle the underground facilities of Michael Rowden's church. After concluding that the tunnels and passages had been used to connect Williston with more distant areas, taking advantage of some old excavations, serious questions remained regarding the extensive chambers of what seemed to be a large underground temple. This site was so deep that it was hard to believe it could have been constructed during Father Rowden's time. Moreover, these structures didn't have much aesthetic relation to the constructions of that era. Archaeologists were interviewed by De Franchella, and none could find historical records of underground cults before the arrival of European colonists. However, that was not the most perplexing discovery in the facilities. That was what led to urgent measures in relation to the definitive burial of the site and the erasure of any public trace of the history of the Church of Mayorahoy. The following images show the deepest vaults found from the passages of the underground temple halls. They depict strange creatures that were passively situated on walls and the floor. Most of them didn't even move or emit any noise. The fragrance they seemed to emit similar to lavender caught attention. However, despite the seemingly harmless nature of the creatures, the existence of extensive breeding grounds of insectoid pupae led to the decision to bury the entire passages in concrete. This was done due to the enormous risk of uncontrolled reproduction of the creatures. Samples of these creatures were taken before sealing the site and were later analyzed in the laboratories of the Pentagon. Цаган-Нуур – самое отдаленное место от монгольской цивилизации. Это место было в центре внимания местных новостей в феврале. После ряда жалоб, которые мэр местности представил в Национальный совет, собрав ряд свидетельств очень обеспокоенных жителей. Местные жители предоставили свои показания каналу 2, выражая беспокойство по поводу того, что они называют вмешательством иностранного вмешательства в их страну. 
Местные обвиняют необычную церковь, осевшую на окраине парка Цыганур в пограничной зоне. С тех пор появились странные существа. Они повлияли на скот, снизив местное производство. Но то, что привлекло внимание больше всего, это их такие особенные формы. Кроме того, местные жители были свидетелями странных ритуалов, происходящих в лесных зонах. С этими иностранцами они никогда не взаимодействовали. стороны, ряд скульптур, которые не были приписаны ни одному художнику, начали появляться в Цагаануре и его окрестностях. Местные власти боятся, что это может быть побегом опасной секты Черной Моли, 